welcome everyone to the latest monthly installment of the EFF Austin Meetup. Normally some of you would be watching this uh, live, but we are having issues with our live stream tonight. So uh, you are most likely watching this video if you are not here in person with us, you're most likely watching it on our YouTube channel at a later date. So, uh, apologies for the inconvenience. Uh, I was just joking that we will maybe explore a Twitch channel for a live stream fallback if this ever happens again. Um, but yeah, welcome new and old faces who have stumbled upon this video. My name is Kevin Welch. I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin. For those of you new to us, EFF Austin is an Austin-based, as you might have guessed, digital civil liberties organization. We're closely affiliated with Electronic Frontier Foundation based out of San Francisco. They're the nation's oldest and biggest digital civil liberties advocacy organization. And think of them sort of as the ACLU for the internet. They basically work really hard to protect your rights in emerging technological spaces, especially with an emphasis on your First and Fourth Amendment rights around free expression and privacy. They try to uh, fight to protect things like net neutrality, end-to-end -end encryption and against encryption backdoors, protecting Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, and just doing a lot of stuff to try to make the internet a place where we can all freely express ourselves in our diverse backgrounds and make it the wonderful, weird place many of us love. <laughs> so. Um, I normally go over a little bit of business here. Um, first, I'll just say our meetups are normally the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. at Capital Factory, which is inside the Omni Hotel in downtown Austin. You can go to our website, you can go to Meetup, Twitter, Facebook, uh, whatever, to uh, learn more about details. Um, We've got a number of fun meetups coming up over the next several months. Um, specifically, we're going to have a talk uh, going in depth on a uh, law you may have heard of, the GDPR, the Global Data Protection Regulations that the EU famously passed, mostly responsible for those infamous banners you see on every website now asking you to accept or deny cookies which uh, is a beautiful example of a law that meant well, but there were some unintended side effects of bad actors trying to subvert the law that the authors of the law did not anticipate. So we're gonna do a bit of an in-depth on GDPR in uh, July. We've got other uh, talks coming up. I'm gonna tentatively be doing something with an org here in town called Bootstrap Austin in August. I don't have the topic of that talk nailed down yet. And in September, we're gonna probably be doing a deep dive into what's known as A11Y, which is basically web accessibility standards, which are very important for those of us who are differently able to be able to all experience the internet equally. So number of exciting topics coming up. Um, yeah, we're an entirely member-run org. If you are passionate about digital liberties and live in Austin, or even not, I encourage you to get involved and learn more. Um, yeah, normally I would do a more involved spiel, but as I said, since we are just dealing with technical difficulties and doing the best we can, I'll probably keep it briefer than normal. Um, so yeah, uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker. And normally I would already have a bio ready, but a uh, little less prepared because of said technical difficulties. So just give me one second. Doo -doo -doo. Now, this part gets too long and boring. I'll just have it edited out. <laughs> <laughs> the magic better. I know. All right. Here we go. So, our speaker this month, uh, he is a returning face, is our good friend Daniel Russler. Uh, Daniel is the maintainer of Acme Tiny, a widely used <laughs> Acme certificate issuance library, and get HTTPS for free.com a zero-knowledge website that allows webmasters to manually obtain free TLS certificates without having to install any programs on their servers. He also maintains other open-source privacy and cryptography-related projects, volunteers for the League of Women Voters, and is the founder and CTO of Utility API, a clean energy software company. And yeah, I've called on Daniel for talks multiple times in the past, and I always bring him in when I want a really nice, nerdy, in-depth examination of a digital civics issue. So specifically, he's going to be going into a topic that some of us may be a bit familiar with, which is basically the technology that makes Let's Encrypt possible, which has now made it where there are TLS certificates for 280 million websites. 
And this is something that just a free nonprofit did, which is kind of incredible. So Daniel's going to go a little bit into the history of this major movement to encrypt the web and how the technology works and why all of that's awesome. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel. Thank you. All right. Um, howdy, everybody. I don't know if anybody, has anybody in a, been on, to my previous talks at EFF Austin? No? OK. Yeah, obviously <laughs> Kevin has. Uh, so as Kevin said, I am uh, the founder and CTO at Utility API, which is a clean tech company. But what I'm here for tonight, um, I've been coming to these uh, EFF Austin meetups for years. Uh, and I'm also an EFF supporter. Um, and the main focus for tonight is around issuing free TLS certificates, which are the certificates that are used in the HTTPS protocol. So that's the little lock in your browser when you go to a website. Um, uh, how do those get issued? I am a maintainer for several different what are called clients. So the way HTTPS works is you have a group of what are called certificate authorities. Certificate authorities are um, basically like audited, trusted um, companies that can issue certificates to various websites and say, hey, we vetted this website. It is This is the um, public-private key pair that this website can be represented by. We're signing this, uh, this certificate for this website. And that's what, uh, and so when you get a certificate from that website, you can be sure that you're actually getting it from the correct server and you're not being man in the middle, which means that like somebody else isn't taking over your connection and then serving it to somebody else. And so as a, uh, for Let's Encrypt is a certificate authority. That is the name of the organization. It's called Let's Encrypt. And it is a certificate authority that issues free certificates for people who want to run HTTPS websites. And the people who want to run HTTPS websites have to interact with that certificate authority somehow, right? And so they use programs called clients. They use these clients in order to communicate with those, with that, with the Let's Encrypt Certificate Authority server. And so I've written a couple of those that are open source. Um, and there's a long history there that I'll get into around the Let's Encrypt um, sort of uh, history. And I do a lot of other civic tech stuff too. So why is this needed? Or why did this come about? Um, so this is the context, right? In uh, post 9-11, you had the NSA starting a wa warrantless wiretapping program, which basically meant that they were creating a dragnet and trying to suck in as much information as possible including um, domestic internet traffic. Um, in 2006, the EFF sued AT&T over um, allowing the mass surveillance, basically a class action lawsuit saying that you run the internet backbone and like you're handing all of our traffic over to the NSA, so please stop doing that. Um, and that was specifically uh, the name of that lawsuit is uh, commonly known as room 641A, which is a room in the San Francisco data center for AT&T. And that's a picture of it right there um, that is basically forking all of the internet backbone traffic flowing through that data center and putting it into a NSA box in addition to forwarding it on to its other locations. So that's basically, your, if you are basically sniffing on the channel and it's not encrypted through the channel, you can just see all the traffic. And HTTP is not encrypted by default, and so you just can watch it. And so that's, that's where that first lawsuit came from. Um, the second lawsuit is in 2008. Um, EFF sued the NSA directly over the uh, mass surveillance program, and that's one of their diagrams here uh, on basically sniffing all of that traffic um, and saying, hey, that's illegal. Um, both of these lawsuits were eventually dismissed, one in 2012, and one was actually dismissed three days ago. Like the second one was finally denied by the Supreme Court about, I think, like just this month on, um, so the EFF finally has finality on all of their lawsuits for, um, for basically demanding that the NSA stop sniffing traffic at the backbone. And 
um, the reasons that both of them were dismissed was that you can't prove it, you have no standing. So it wasn't that it's not happening, it was that you have no ability, the EFF, to sue us in order to do this because officially this doesn't exist. So you cannot, um, you don't have any standing in order to tell us that it is unconstitutional and a violation of the Fourth Amendment. So that's where we are now. Um, and then in 20, or that's where we were back in the late 2000s, mid to late 2000s was we knew this stuff was going on. There wasn't really much legally we could do to fight it or we tried. Um, but outside of that, um, we start to move into other ways of combating this mass surveillance. So um, one is leaks. So the Snowden leaks in 2013 um, disclosed a whole, the specifics of a whole bunch of internal programs and that caused a big you know, amount of stuff, and it actually was the um, initial seeding event for the Let's Encrypt movement, which I'll get into next. So that was kind of like the trigger point, um, because at that time, the EFF lawsuits were still working their way through the appeal system. Um, and then immediately after Snowden, there was a huge amount of discussion around like, we can't just rely on these lawsuits in order to combat this mass surveillance. We need to, as engineers of the internet, we need to figure out a way to do that. And so um, there was uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which basically is the governing body for uh, all of the standards around HTTPS and HTTP and SMTP and like all of the internet protocols are written at the Inter uh, Internet Engineering Task Force. They adopted RFC 7258 um, as a current best practice, which uh, is pervasive monitoring is an attack. So it basically adopts officially the attitude that passive surveillance and pervasive surveillance is a threat to the freedom of the internet. And so it is a best current practice to build into your protocols the assumption that you need to combat that. So protocols going forward and advancements going forward, you need to basically take that into account. You can't just pretend it doesn't exist or assume the network is trusted. So back in the early days of the internet, you basically just like assumed that the, the network was trusted. This basically solidifies the attitude that the network should not be trusted and you should do work as an engineer to in your protocol design to combat that. So that's where we were like in the early 2010s. So uh, this is where the Let's Encrypt story comes into play. So after the Snowden leaks, we, uh, there were uh, several organizations, privacy advocacy and like internet organizations that got together um, privately initially because privacy is important for organizing and uh, uh, yeah, that's the whole reason the Fourth Amendment exists is to allow or organizing in secret. Um, so several of these advocacy organizations and internet organizations got together and was like, we need to create a way, like we need to, map, we need to figure out a way to solve the encryption problem on the web. Because if the NSA is likely going to continue to be allowed to sniff the backbone of the internet um, uh, data centers, then, and the Snowden re re uh, revelations um, basically uh, showed that a lot of the data center to data center traffic was also being sniffed, we need to create an ecosystem where everything is encrypted by default. And so they created a very, very mildly named, so as not to draw attention, organization, nonprofit, called the Internet Security Research Group, or ISGR. Right? And so they filed all of their paperwork, they created the uh, nonprofit, they began working on the process of creating a new certificate authority, very under the radar. It was a very, very close hold thing. I heard rumors of something, like I was on mailing lists around that time, like trying to convince people that we should buy an old certificate authorities thing and then just like commandeer that and use that. And I wasn't getting a lot of traction from a lot of the people that I would think that would get a lot of attraction or uh, a lot of traction from. And this was why, because those people knew about this initiative and was able to like knew that there was actually an initiative to create a new certificate authority. Finally, it went public in 20, 
14, where they announced, the EFF announced that there would be a new certificate authority um, called Let's Encrypt, and Let's Encrypt would be a free certificate authority, and it would be really free. So at the time, I think there was one other certificate authority that was privately held um, that would allow you to get a certificate for free. However, it was very clunky, and it also required you to pay to revoke. And so I don't remember, do you remember Heartbleed? I think that was around that time. And a lot of people who had gotten those free certificates all of a sudden had to revoke their certificates and get issued new ones using the new, like, safer way of doing it. And that company just, like, made bank off of, like, all of the people who had to revoke their certificates, and it pissed off a lot of people. So anyway, um, that was, like, in the, like, year before this, this happened, or sometime very close to around that time. Um, and so this was obviously welcome news, and the fact that it was coming from the EFF gave it a ton of credibility, because if there's anything you know about the EFF, it's that they fight mass surveillance. And so, like, that's what, um, that's what their reputation was on, so the fact that it was from, they were one of the early participants in it, gave it a ton of credibility that this was actually a legit thing, it wasn't some scam or some, um, like non-credible thing. What's that? Or a honeypot. Or a honeypot. It wasn't some, yeah, exactly. If the EFF is doing this thing, you can be very sure that it's not run by the CIA. Because <laughs> the people that killed the clipper chip are clearly... Yes, <laughs> exactly. So um, that obviously got it a lot of attention at the time. And in 2015, they actually started issuing certificates. And so that has been awesome, um, and then in 2018, so at the time in 2015, they began issuing certificates using what's called a cross signature, so the, um, the certificate authority that was trusted by the browsers at the time was signing their intermediate, and then Let's Encrypt would then sign the end certificate, um, but they also applied to get their own certificate in the root stores, and that takes multiple years, takes usually about three to five years, and so they started that process at that time, and by 2018, they were basically in all of the root stores, so they did not need to cross-sign their certificates anymore, and so at that point, they are on their own, they are issuing certificates, they are a trusted certificate authority, so you can just go to them and get your certificates, and you don't have to be cross-signed by anybody. And then in 2019, the Internet Engineering Task Force uh, adopted RFC 8555, which is the automatic certificate management environment, which is the protocol that Let's Encrypt basically invented to automate the process of issuing certificates. And so this basically, it up until that point, it was kind of their own API. They just had their own API. And it wasn't like officially standardized, but they did take it through the standardization process. And now it's actually being used as the protocol by multiple different certificate authorities, not just Let's, Let's Encrypt anymore. So that's really exciting. And then in this year, um, they received the Lev, Lev Chin Prize for real world cryptography. So that's kind of the timeline of the Let's Encrypt story all the way from, you know, the Snowden leaks up until, like, being very well regarded and prominent in the, in the web. So what is the impact of Let's Encrypt and the ISGR? So first off, uh, as Kevin mentioned, about 200 million, over 200 million um, individual certificates have been issued are active at any given point under Let's Encrypt, and that represents about 90 million domains, and those are registered domains, those aren't subdomains, so these are like, you know, somebody paid, 90 million people paid um, for those domains, which represents about 60% of all registered domains. So you're covering about half of the internet as far as registered domains, or are over those, half of the internet. Global, or just global. Just global numbers. Yeah, yes. global numbers. Um, and so, the. Let's Encrypt basically encrypts about over half of the internet as far as domain coverage. And so that's pretty awesome. And 93% of all US websites, um, and I think about 79% of global websites are now over HTTPS. And that was well below 50% at the time of the announcement in 2014. And so it was well less than 50%. Um, I guess when they started. So, do you know where 
where the 21% non-globally, are there specific places that is highly concentrated? I don't know. I feel like you're leading me to an answer, but I don't know. Well, I have questions, <laughs> but I don't want to assert without knowing. Yeah, yeah. Um, the answer is I don't have a definitive answer for you. Um, I'm sure I can speculate, but I'm sure anyway. I'm sure but I don't want to spread yeah. disinformation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. No worries. So, also, uh, Chrome and Firefox uh, start explicitly marking HTTP as insecure. So, prior to a huge amount of websites, over ninety percent of websites becoming secure through HTTPS, you uh, the browsers didn't feel comfortable to like you know have a little lock with a red line through it saying oh this is insecure. Now they can because most websites are secure, and so that ins further incentivizes users to pay attention and be like oh I'm in a insecure I'm on an insecure uh, system now, so I'm I'm gonna you know notice that or contact the website owner to try to get them to to switch. So that was a way for the browsers to keep pushing HTTPS. Um, and so the attitude of all of this, just to back up, the attitude of EFF, the attitude of Let's Encrypt, is unambiguously like encryption is a good thing. We want more of it. We want it to be ubiquitous. That is the IETF kind of like best practice. Pervasive monitoring is an attack. This is an un unambiguously good thing to encrypt communications across the internet. So um, in addition to that, new JavaScript APIs, so things like WebRTC or um, the webcam sort of stuff or Bluetooth, uh, Web Bluetooth, um, all of those are starting to require a secure context, which means they only run on HTTPS websites. Um, and so that's another way if you want to take advantage of new modern um, JavaScript APIs or web technologies, you're going to need to... Um, be on an HTTPS website. You're, they're just like flat out not going to work on an insecure website. And then Firefox has recently started within I think the last couple of years um, doing HTTPS by default, which means that when you type in a web address like google.com and hit enter, it will by default request the HTTPS version first. It won't try to do the HTTP version first. And so, and um, the other thing is it's starting to encrypt its DNS traffic over HTTPS as well by default. And so you're basically, your DNS queries and your uh, web requests are starting to be by default encrypted. Um, and then the most recent thing that I thought was really, really cool is the ESF uh, maintained a, yeah, what's up? Um, DNS, so um, depending on what DNS server I'm assigned to by my DHCP, whatever it is, that, yeah. uh, it may or may not. Right. Be doing DNS over HTTPS, is that correct? Um, that is correct. Firefox, the browser, just ignores whatever you're assigned for HTTPS and uses one of its own. Firefox uses its own DNS? Yes. Really? Yeah. What about Chrome? Um, you can, I don't think it's enabled by default, you can turn it on. I'll also add that Chrome is infamous for if you are like, I know better, I want another one. They're like, no, you don't. You're going to talk to Google's DNS server. Well, because then, right, yeah. then they can track me. Yeah, yeah. but DN, like, like Google DNS supports DNS, DNS over HTTPS. I, I think you can set up a system wide now using network key. You can. I just yes. at a time where circumventing Google's DNS yeah. provider was a just so on, on Linux, you can start to enable DNS over HTTPS by default, um, just from a you know network level. So you're right, yeah. So, so yeah. So that's another recent thing. Is it like HTTPS is expanding just beyond web traffic and now into DNS traffic? Um, it's just that easy. So, and the most recent one was EFF's plugin that they've released back around 2014, 2015 called HTTPS Everywhere that maintained basically a list of websites that had both HTTP and HTTPS and would always default you to HTTPS because the website may or may not have had a you know, redirect built in. Um, it is now sunset because there's no reason to have it again because everybody is starting to do it and the browsers are starting to do it by default. So they're basically, it's, it's no longer needed. We have solved the problem to, the lar to a large extent of encrypting the web, which is you're pretty saying, cool. What saying. What's that? You're saying we've won. We've won. So the fact that, there's some, that EFF is sunsetting that is like we won. 
which is pretty awesome. So, and also like website hosting providers like Squarespace and WordPress and Shopify and like all of them are obviously including HTTPS by default, just like in free. It used to be you had to pay extra to have it like be a secure website. I remember having to pay, I think, what was it, Weebly or something like that, an extra monthly fee to have it be secure. And now it's just like by default included, that's just the way it is. And so like Let's Encrypt, the Let's Encrypt impact is HTTP now, HTTPS is now table stakes for the web. It's just something you gotta do in order to be regarded with any credibility on the internet now. Uh, for hosting websites. And so, yes, the takeaway is that Let's Encrypt won. Like, hands down, they won. They were extremely effective. I have the utmost respect for the impact of this organization. Yeah? You say that, but I found out yesterday that if you host your website on Azure, your DNS, they give not support DNS sec for their customers. So that's different from HTTPS? I know. Yeah. <laughs> We're saying we won the encryption war. Ah. There are still major gaps. Yes, there are still major gaps. The moment um, for just browser web traffic, we definitely are 93% of the way there. So we're, for DNS, that's I think DNS is the new frontier as far as encryption. And I feel I, like there is we're still in the early days of that. I think. And I forget, and I'm forgetting the details, but I know a while back there was one issue related to essentially. Um, virtual servers on the same machine where you might have DNS routing to two separate mm. servers mm -hmm. on the same box, like that piece wasn't encrypted of the whole handshake process. That, yeah. That was all security. So that was called SNI. And SNI, um, and yes, SNI in previous versions of TLS was not encrypted. I think it is now in TLS 1.3. So, so yeah, it'll it'll slowly fade into like as TLS 1.3 becomes like the major standard for encryption, the SNI will start to be more. Server name identification. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So ISGR. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. Um, so if the NSA is still taking all the traffic. Yes. 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 Um, so that is the next front of combating mass surveillance, where like the data center in Utah and that sort of thing, like that's where you have there the assumption. Of course, all of this is unknown officially. The assumption is that they're still scooping up the traffic and just storing it. And when they're able to decrypt it, or if they want to throw a ton of compute power and decrypt a specific connection, then that is still totally feasible. Um, however, it makes their lives a whole lot harder than it was prior to Let's Encrypt. So it was, this wasn't an ultimate solution, but a very, very, very effective means to discourage the level of surveillance that the NSA was doing prior to this. Yeah. Since we are talking politics now, yeah. um, it came across my desk or whatever that the US Congress was looking at completely bland, banning encryption for us, so um, maybe partly banning it in some way. Some way. So the that particular topic, um, so I don't want to fully derail, no, but um, that particular topic is specifically in reference to um, end-to-end -end encryption, which means that the server that is serving, so like Signal, the Signal app, that sort of thing, can't read the messages going through its system because it's from the user, it's encrypted from the user all the way to the other user, and the web server, the hosting company, doesn't know what it's transporting. Right. That part is what is under uh, consideration. So end to end is being attacked. Or end to end no? is the, you the 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 bill that I think you're referring to, yeah. um, or the 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 discussion that's happening is basically around how a server must be able to service a warrant. So oh. if they get a warrant, they can't say, "Well, we can't give you anything because we don't know." Oh. They have to write their protocols so that it goes to the server encrypted, gets decrypted, or is decryptable yeah. 
in the case of a warrant and then gets served back out to the other participant. So the end-to-end -end nature of it is the thing that is under attack there. Yeah. So, any other questions? And I just yeah. have a few things I'll sure. add on what you said, which is like, yes, and that's why one, end to end encryption is so important, and two, because people like Moxie Morrow and Spike who run Signal are not idiots, they're already anticipating. Not anymore, he, uh, he so retired. Oh, oh, right, he quit. <laughs> but, um, but they've already anticipated this. There are already Web 3.0 peer-to-peer uh, protocols that are essentially attempting to replicate Signal in a pure peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Yes. So even if you outlawed it in encryption, it wouldn't do any good. You'd have right. to outlaw encryption entirely, basically. And um, yeah. So it's not actually flowing through your web server anymore. Right. There's no web server involved. Yeah. Well, there might be on the nodes, but yeah. yeah. And then the other thing they try to do is even within the encryption. You can try to mandate what's called client-side scanning, where you could force Apple or Microsoft or even the Linux Foundation to say you have to, when it gets the encrypted on the target computer, you still then have yeah. to compare it against bad files, basically. Yeah. Oh, I heard about that too. Yeah. yeah that's even uh, so. Yeah. So it's a never-ending battle. One of the main <laughs> And I guess also just with all these money over the right. conference. <laughs> and one last thing, just to follow a little bit on what you said, it's like, yeah, it, the, none of this prevents the NSA or any other group who wants to decrypt something from doing so. There's always security flaws. You can throw enough compute power at anything and decrypt it. It just makes mass surveillance economically infeasible. There's not enough compute power to decrypt everything. So you have to actually have some evidence and choose who you're looking at, which is kind of what we want. Nobody yeah. is saying if somebody who's broken the law should not be able to be served a warrant, but you can't just decide everybody's guilty beforehand. Yeah. Okay. All right. So how do they pull this off? Well, um, the ISGR, which is the parent organization for the Let's Encrypt Certificate Authority, which is, stands for Internet Security, oh, ISRG research group. I misspelled that in the slides. Whatever. Um, that's actually kind of a feature, not a bug for that particular organization. So it's a 501c3, so it's a nonprofit. It's run entirely off of donations. There are large tech companies that, that donate to it. It only has a budget as of 2019's um, nonprofit filings of $3.8 million. So it's run incredibly efficiently. It only has 19 staff, the vast majority of which are um, software engineers and site reliability, SREs, uh, site reliability engineers, that sort of thing. And running the math, they pay everybody pretty well to see yeah. not taking an unfair share. Like, that's like yeah, like no, it's, a person. It's, they thing. don't skimp on salaries, but they don't need that many people, right? right? Mm -hmm. Because they're just running a server and running, running multiple servers and running very well. Um, their, their servers are open source. So Boulder is the name of their certificate authority server, and so that is the actual server um, um, server code that they run, um, and it's been audited, and it's open source, and it's really, really fun to read through. It's written in Go. Um, and then it also has an official client, official supported client. Um, it used to be called uh, Let's, Enc uh, Let's Enc the, just like Let's Encrypt as the client, but now it's called CertBot, and it's also open source. I think it's mostly written in Python now. Or it was originally written. And it's very easy, especially if you're on Linux, pulling it with any standard yeah. package manager. And they're run on just a few, like just a handful of beefy servers, right? It's not that much. They don't run in, like on AWS or Azure or anything like that. They just have, you know, some beefy server sitting in a data center, and that handles half of the internet's certificate authority stuff. Yep. Yeah. Are they using just a handful of beefy servers so they only have a handful of HSMs? Or what was the, the rationale behind that design decision? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if it's what you're talking about, like if they just have Because the HSMs are more expensive than the servers, so Right. Well a lot of times they'll have a bunch of apps yeah. an application layer that can call back to a dedicated HSM just for the signing up. Yes. So the signing operation is like one of like ten steps that you have to go through in order to get a certificate. So requires access to private. Yes. Exactly. They want to keep that in the HSM, which is probably required. It is. The 
PLS for intermediate certs, the, yeah. Uh, the powers of B, yeah. Uh, they probably wanted to include the HSM server, which might be why they did that. I was just curious. If yeah. Know. Definitely one per data center. I know that they are in a couple of data centers so that they have failover. Um, and actually, one of the features that they started doing recently was when they, when we get into the challenges, we'll talk about this, where you actually get challenged from multiple different data centers. So say you say, serve this file on this domain, right, and have this contents when we get into the challenges for you, proving you own your own domain. They'll hit it from multiple different data centers, from multiple different internet service providers, so to reduce the likelihood that you can have a DNS poisoning attack from any particular DNS server. So it'll basically, so your DNS has to be widely distributed um, across many different DNS servers in order for them to validate the challenge, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And do you know, do they own their, the nonprofit, do they own their own server farms or are they running somebody yes. else's server? No, they, they yeah, bigger, that's what like the half of their staff are basically sysadmin type roles where, you know, you're basically maintaining the servers. Because I figured with that physical servers, no cloud, rest, like, it sounds to me like everything is involved in making it where this is a neutral process where they can't be coerced by anything. Yeah, and keep in mind that like the talent pool that you're and the people who want to work here are like anti mass surveillance zealots, right? And so like it's a very, very hard to corrupt organization and it's run extremely efficiently and so there's not a lot of bloat. There's not a lot of things you can exploit in it. It's a very efficient thing. There's even a with you don't support the mission. It doesn't matter how good you yeah. are, they will not. Yeah, so the culture was set from the beginning that this is like this is a nonprofit that is on a mission to do encryption and do it well. And I think that they've done that extremely well. I guess that I would say I, I suspect especially with that budget, they're, it's not like they're paying market rate for Luna HSMs or something. Like they're, they're probably either using like the YubiKey, Yubico HSM, or maybe no. they made their own. No, the Yubico HSM won't do it. Yeah, no, the, we're, we're, they're, they're real, like, in order to get approved for issuing intermediate certificates, like you gotta have legit HSMs. Yeah, you're talking fails for the safety. I wouldn't be surprised if they actually disclosed that on their blog or in their reports, but I don't know that's that down into the weeds on the infrastructure. Um, but yeah, but it's passed all the audits and everything like that, so it's legit. It's been legit for half a decade now. Uh, okay, so my personal takeaways from the Let's Encrypt story. Um, first off, it only takes about $25 million to encrypt half the internet which is pretty amazing. Like the fact that nobody had like just plopped down that money beforehand, like it's not nothing, like it's not free, but it's also not billions of dollars, which is what you would think it would have to be, right? And so um, the second takeaway is kind of the derivative of that is that a small group of genuine dedicated people can have a massive impact. And so um, particularly, so jumping down to takeaway number five, when market incentives are not properly aligned, nonprofits can actually be way, way more effective than for profits. Because if you have your zealots that you are like delicate or like dedicated to actually doing that thing and you don't care about the money, like there's not going to be competition. Like Let's Encrypt basically swept the field with the existing certificate authorities having no incentive to compete with them because like there's no money in it. It's all free. Like you can't make money out of it. And so like why the hell would uh, whoever the GoDaddy SSL or something like try to compete with that and they just got swept off the field. And so it's really, really impressive when you have an effective nonprofit entering a non-functioning or non-properly non aligned incentive market. So that's, that's one of the things that I found that's really, really interesting about this particular example. And the second, uh, I guess, is a derivative of the $25 million, number four, with proper organization. It doesn't actually take that much to get through a massive bureaucratic and procedural barriers. Like, it's not nothing, it's only, it's $25 million, but it's also not billions of dollars. And so, like, becoming a certificate authority, like, after Let's Encrypt became the certificate authority, all of a sudden, Google Cloud became a certificate authority, and Amazon Azure became, or Amazon, AWS, and Azure like became their own certificate authorities. And so it basically opened the floodgates for people being like, hey, 
it's not impossibly hard to get through this. It kind of sucks, but like we can actually commit some money and actually do this and and get through the process ourselves. So that was really really interesting that like they proved that it's not a completely insurmountable thing that the attitude was beforehand that oh you know only the only the people only the for profit organizations devoted to it can do this. Um, and then the last one that I want to point out was the credibility really mattered. Like this got its initial traction and its initial support because it was backed by people who everybody knew was serious about it. And so, uh, so EFF, Mozilla, the fact that they kind of were the ones starting it, if it was like some startup of like two people, I don't think that it would have nearly gotten the traction that it, it, it needed to. Uh, it, the fact that it was spun out of organizations that had that huge amount of reputation and credibility. Um, was a, was a key driver for the, the adoption curve of it. Um, okay, so that concludes the history and the talk about like Let's Encrypt as a thing. Um, now I'm gonna switch over into the ACME protocol itself. Before I do that, does anybody have any questions on the political or you know organization side? I'm sorry I was late and I'm a little confused about yeah. what this thing is, but uh, I, I remember hearing something about I thought, oh, encryption is going to be free because I don't, I don't yeah. you know, like I have these cheap web server things and, yeah. you know, and they charge extra and I said, oh, so I can get a certificate for free now. But yeah. I, said, I thought about that for like five years and then suddenly I saw something and saying, oh, that's not going to work or it's deprecated or it's the web server, the, the Google or the Firefox, they don't like let's encrypt encryption stuff. Was there, has there been some political pushback? I think there was. I saw so, an article about a year ago maybe. So I think you're not talking about Let's Encrypt. I think you're talking about self-signed certificates. Oh, yes. That is one. Yes. So that is different. You okay. You're talking about the role of the certificate role that broke a lot of over-operating That got fixed, though. Well, it meant that a lot of over-operating systems that had updated their certificate authorities uh, wouldn't accept Let's Encrypt certificates yes. after a certain date. This is what, right. six months ago, maybe? Um, Yes, I think that that turned out to be kind of like Y2K and that like nothing really happened. Everybody was worried about it and then there didn't actually turn out to be that many old certificates. Oh, it was a problem for you. Wow, you have you have root stores that are that old? Yeah, I mean, I had sent to like six servers that had been updating on my own, but hadn't updated their certificate authority. So I downloaded the utility and basically generated new servers. Okay, but getting back yeah. to my question. Yeah, self-signed. Yeah, so, so. That's different. I don't, so now I'm a little confused. So if I, yeah. if I, if I have my own certificate self-signed, then I wouldn't need Let's Encrypt. But Let's Encrypt is going to somehow create a certificate for me and I can use it? Yes. So that's what they're doing. So basically, if you self-sign a certificate, your browser doesn't trust you, right? right? It says, like, who yeah. the hell is this signer, yeah. right? But Let's Encrypt is trusted by browsers. Okay. And so it, if you go get your certificate from Let's Encrypt, okay. the browser will trust you. And I, I can set it up on my server easily? Yes. And, and all that stuff. We're actually works. gonna do that in about okay. five minutes. Well, let, me, <laughs> let me not delay you further. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the can go suing NCF that, sorry, it's suing well, the... Well, there was an act, as Daniel Turvich I said, there was an active lawsuit in progress after the lease came out. As he said, they literally, very recently, the lawsuit was finally concluded, and they concluded that EFF didn't have standing, which Daniel went into a bit of what that means, but also another way, of, in addition to that, this doesn't officially exist, so you can't complain about it. It's also basically a way of saying, you can't prove this harmed you in any way, so you don't have standing. Yeah. Uh, it, it also had to do with the state secrets thing, right? I mean, yes. Yeah, so the bicycle. You couldn't. You couldn't right do discovery, so you couldn't prove that it existed, which means so that you couldn't prove damages. State secrets clause, where basically the government can say we can't talk about this because of national security, and unfortunately, the Supreme Court bought that, and they were like, okay, even though Snowden revealed everything in 2013, they were like, okay, yeah, national security, we can't talk about it. Therefore, you have no legal standing because you don't have evidence. So we're in this bizarre Kafka situation where we all know what's going on and the Supreme Court has said, yes, but we're all going to pretend it isn't. I mean, or it's a, yeah, it's a loophole where you can't actually do anything about it. 
Right. Quick, interesting digression. I was in the military when uh, Manning released the documents, and they straight up told us, they're like, those are not declassified. Anyone caught looking at those will be, yeah. you'll get in trouble. Yeah. It, was, it was really weird. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, I've been afraid so, to look at these documents because I've figured stuff like that was the case for you personally. Well, I don't think civilians. Yeah. civilians, if you get it through non, if you just you, get it through the press, the then it doesn't matter. The Assange case is only about criminalizing like journalistic sources. Like as an ordinary citizen, we're really even farther gone than I think we are. Yeah. You're going to get in trouble. Your First Amendment. You didn't commit the crime. You're just looking at a document that's out there in the public. So, so yeah. looking at a secret, U.S. citizen looking at a secret U.S. document that is. Available from a non from the Washington Post, for example. Yeah. 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 Well, what if I found the server somewhere? Then exactly. you well, might be at risk. Well, so yeah. He's not wrong. There, there is actually a, a project that documented all the Snowden documents, like scanned them and put them up. Okay. Um, so that's not like a military server or anything. You wouldn't get yeah. in trouble for that. Yeah. Well, and actually, one of the earliest cases that EFF was involved in is involved in exactly the issue you talked about, where like one of the foundational cases that led to the EFF happened right here in Austin. Um, one of our former board members, Steve Jackson of Steve Jackson Games fame. Basically, one his offices got raided by the Secret Service because one of his employees had downloaded a document to the company's internal BBS that turned out it had been stolen by somebody else on the other side of the country. It was an internal AT and T document that he didn't steal it; he just found it on the internet. But somebody else had stolen it. Basically, EFF argued, no, he didn't steal it. He just found it publicly available on the internet. He did not commit a crime, and you now damage Steve Ashton's livelihood by stealing all the servers they need for their business, they won their case, basically. So EFF yeah. established, you found something illegal that you were not involved in stealing it, it's now out in the public domain, you are not a criminal because you found it or saw it. Or so if the idiot, uh, let's say some idiot in the army, put something publicly available, they didn't intend to, then... As long as you didn't do anything illegal to access it, like you didn't do any kind of hacking, if you just stumbled on this kid's WordPress website, then yeah, it's his bad, not yours. The BS oh, or the website. That's messed up. The BS that the Assange case hinges on is that, that they claim, the BS the Assange case hinges on is they can't actually claim that his journalistic activities are illegal. They try to get him on that he aided Manning in hacking to right. obtain the or documents. Encouraged. Or encouraged, yeah. encouraged it, yes. Oh, it's having me log in again. Hang on. Yeah, it, you have to re-log in after one hour. <sighs> it's very annoying. <laughs> Hang on. Also, We're just now... Uh, any other just questions just before I move into the actual I protocol side of things? That good with servers and self-hosting well, and stuff. I was able to do it. So you should probably move so we don't run out of time. Oh, were you out of... Shoot. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's logging in right now, I think. Exactly. You have to oh. attend on that. And uh, we only have the room until now. So we're stopping at 9 no matter what. So you'll have a full hour to hang out with us if you want to get a drink in the That's lobby. Right there, you have an hour. Yeah, but yeah we're, we're fine. Uh, this, is the, fine. this is short. But I, you are right. If you parked in the garage, leave before 10. It is really expensive if you don't get the discount. So. Well, oh, come on. Okay, good. Okay, good. All right. So uh, ACME is the official protocol for Let's Encrypt and also now other certificate authorities. And it's basically a checkout. It's an ordering system. So it starts off where you generate a public-private key pair that you use to sign your request to it. So think of that as your login or your registration. And then it will, uh, you also generate a key pair for the public and private key for your website. So those are two different key pairs. So you have two different key pairs, one for your registration with Let's Encrypt, and then one for your just individual website. And then you can make as many of those as you want for all your websites and just use your same registration to register all of those various things. You can also generate a new registration for every single time you want to do things. It doesn't really matter. It just needs something that, um, uh, to it, start signing requests so that it knows you are who you are um, throughout the entire process. So it's no login credentials. You don't have to register on a website. It's completely an API protocol. 
So the first three things are generate key pair for the Let's Encrypt registered account, generate your key pair for your website, and then you generate what is part of every single HTTPS thing, which is called create a, uh, uh, you create a certificate signing request, or a CSR. Um, and that's basically your request saying, hey, I have these domains, this is my public key that I want to associate with those dom these domains, please sign this certificate and give it back to me. So even before Let's Encrypt, a CSR was what you used in order to um, request a certificate from a certificate authority. So next up, we're actually getting into the API requests themselves. Um, so the first one is you uh, discover the endpoints because the endpoints can change. Um, over time. And so there is a slash directory which gives you the list of the endpoints, the API endpoints that you want to use. And so slash directory is really the only thing you need to start interacting with this API. You don't need any other, to know any of the other endpoints because they're always in directory. And so when we go through our example, you'll see that. Um, is and that then, called slash directory? It's actually called slash directory. And this is on my computer or? This is on their, their web server. So the Let's Encrypt Acme web server, if you go to that website and do slash directory, that's where it is. And other certificate authorities will be their web server slash directory. Okay, so you left out that part. Yes, exactly. So the Maybe. domain will is kind of assumed to be the web server at this point. Or sorry, sorry, to be the certificate authorities server. Which would always have the same name though. Yes, so you can imagine that this yeah. get would be letscrypt.org slash directory. Okay. And this would be post to letscrypt.org slash acne slash. HTTP colon. Uh, yeah, yeah, whole exactly. Thing. We'll get into that oh, okay. uh, in okay. the okay. example. Right. This, this um, is the first line of the, of the HTTP request. Correct. So. Yeah. Basically, yeah, it's just shorthand for now. Um, okay, we get the stuff. All right. Yeah. So register an account. So that's, you create an account. If you already haven't registered one, you can skip that one if you've already registered one. And then you make an order. And so an order basically says, hey, I have these identifiers, which are domains, um, that I want to you to validate. And it will come back and give you an order endpoint that then you go and get, and you see what challenges you need to pass. And so there are two types of challenges. One is called an HTTP challenge, and one is called a DNS challenge. An HTTP challenge basically says, hey, host this particular string at this particular endpoint, please, on your domain, and we will then check to see if you actually did that. And then the DNS challenge is, hey, put this text entry on your DNS um, server and, or your DNS entries, and we will check that. And so you can validate your domain two different ways, and it gives you the options of those, and then you say, hey, I am now serving that domain, or serving that string on that page, and then it goes and checks to make sure that you are, and then when it's satisfied, you'll get a authorization status valid for that particular order, and then you can finalize it by submitting the CSR, it checks to see that everything is valid, and if it is, it will sign your certificate, and you can download it, and that's how you get a certificate. Yep. And I'm correct. The challenge is basically to verify that I actually control the server I claim I yes. own, basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's, it's, so on domains that there is like a blacklist, so like github.io, for example, you can't, issue certificates for because they know that you, it's just subdomain driven, right? It's your website.github.io for GitHub pages. So stuff like that, like they do, they have a big old long list of black, or a big old long blacklist in the Boulder. What's that? There's a DNS record you can publish. Oh, great. It's the certificate authorities that are supposed to be able to publish for certain domains and let's encrypt at least respects that. Yes, nice. yeah. Um, and then also certificate transparency is another aspect of this where once you issue it, that will log into a public log of this Let's Encrypt has issued a certificate for this domain and that is a public record. And so if you don't want your domain to be known, you should take that into account whenever you request records for that. So that's an area where, um, and the reason for that is because there's a bunch of like security software tools that will basically monitor those logs and let you know if all of a sudden somebody has hacked your server and issued a certificate for it. And oh my God, like, you know, now you know because now there's a certificate that you didn't create out there for it. And so you can then take steps to mitigate that. 
Sorry. Yeah. Did you say you can opt out of it? Um, no. Okay. It's you, you, you. You said you have to take that into account. And I was you have to take that into account that if you right. don't want your domain in it. You have to, so generally the best way that I've seen it is you get a wildcard certificate for like one level up. And then so it's star dot whatever domain is like the certificate you get. And then you can issue, or then you can set whatever domains like below that, and you, nobody knows what those specific you don't domains want are. Subdomains in yeah. You don't. They don't want people knowing what they are. Exactly. So like okay. normally you see this used for a lot of like internal things where like it's like internal dot company name dot com is like the certificate, but then you know you know staging dot internal dot company dot com is not the is is not known, but it's still using the certificate. Yeah. If you have a domain that's been expired in like a week, can you get a cert from Let's Encrypt that's like a couple months still? Or do they, what do they do about that? So your cert certificates from Let's Encrypt are valid for 90 days. Yeah, but if, if your domain's like expiring in a week, and then let's say you don't buy it, let's say somebody else buys it in two weeks. Yes. So you your certificate will still be valid. Yes. So normally domains are put into a hold. Yeah. Yeah. Thirty days. Okay. I think it's like ninety days. I think it's a while. Yeah. Multiple periods, right? Yeah. The sunset period would be new, and then they put it like the like the year period or something. They bake it a little while. Yeah. And there, there's safety stuff baked in because sometimes you're dealing with a uh, a reseller who has gone out of business or defunct and you need to rescue your website because you can't renew because they don't even exist and don't answer your calls anymore so yeah they they put in buffers because stuff yeah. happens um okay so how does an api request actually look like so this is the format it uses uh what is called json object signing and encryption or um jose and it looks like this. There are three different parts of it. There is the protected part, which basically is what public key you are using to sign the request. The second is the payload itself. So here the payload is terms of service agreed true. And then there is a signature, which is the protected base 64 uh, encoded uh, protected, and then the payload, which is base64 encoded. You sign all that, and then you base64 encode it. So it's three different things of uh, three different key values that are all base64 encoded. So it's not really readable, which I don't know. Like I'm, it is what it is. It was what they did. I don't know that I'm super a fan of Jose stuff, but whatever. Like I'm not really a JSON Web Token fan, so. Um, yeah. So, like, protected and payload in the signature, is that the same as the protected and yes. payload? Yes. So, why is the third field needed if it's uniquely determined by an algorithm on the first two fields? Okay, so, yeah, so the protected is key information, right? right? And it is, like, it's not signed. There's no signature on that first one. And then payload is also not signed. And so these are two unsigned things. Right. You're just including them here. Okay. And then the signature, when you sign something, this is just ends up as basically a signature string. It does not include the original values, right? And so you end up with like, I don't know, what, 256 bits of yeah. signature. Right. And then you base 64 encode that, and that's your signature. So there, you couldn't just include, so you have to include this for your signature, and it does not contain the payload or the protected values. You have to include those separately. Now, why they base 64 encode these and these as part of the actual like thing, I don't know. I think it's so that you can very easily verify it because you could have these keys out of order. You have to serialize it like XML. 
uh, signatures have a whole serialization thing, and I think they were trying to avoid that. Like, well, yeah. all I need is the signature. The other part just seemed kind of redundant, you know. I yeah. would just define well, the first part of the header. It tells you how to verify. What yeah, so here we go. Oh, you can't I use, think of it as a header or handle the signature, and the signature has to come last because it goes over the data. Yeah. So. I, I suspect this is has a lot of influence from the XML um, sort of signature sort of stuff. I, I would guess probably trying to emulate similar looking behavior inside of ASN1. Oh, maybe. ASN1 is, is similar, it's just not JavaScript, and it may or may not be basic before, depending on what you're coding. Your... Gotcha. Yeah. So let's encrypt something. When you said ASN1, you mean X509. Yeah, so, so ASN1 ASN is just the encoding. It's just the encoding. So the, in the same, the same way that we have the JSON structure here, they're emulating the ASN1 structure. I mean, the, yeah, the X509 is the, the old structure, protocol. Right? Is that, isn't ASN just the <coughs> notation format? Yes, that's right. The so, syntax for the syntax, and the actual syntax descriptor would be an X. So, yeah, the X509 was like a, um, like a totally different kind of protocol or whatever, they just copy pasted some of the chunks from X509 forward in time. So that's the kind of basis of our HTTPS um, certificates and stuff these days. Yes, yeah, it's not really X509. X509 is the basis, is the format yeah. Yeah. for yeah. HTTPS service. Yeah, basically. Yeah. It, it, it's just a, a holdover from a bygone era. <laughs> so. Okay. Describe using yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Um, let's encrypt something. So, I have, I'm going to get out of this, I have a website. Do, 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 bring it over here. And if I go to HTTP, run, or sorry, EFF talk run dot cheap I will get boo insecure response <laughs> right so this is what I was talking about earlier by default browsers will like warn you be like there's a red slash it's insecure um, okay so I am going to bring over my browser here and so this is sites um, and I'm moving to cat EFF talk. So this is the server. I'm just saying boo and secure response. And I have a location which is called well known Acme Challenge set up to a static directory. And so this is how we're going to start to do that. So anything, so if I go to that directory, Dub HTML challenges, and I see what's in that directory. I have a file called aaa.txt, or txt, and if I see what's in that file, it's just bbb. And so if I go to my browser again, and I go to what was it? Well, known Acme challenge. Was it plural or not? It was plural. Um, AAA.txt, I will get something. Is that it? Are you sure you need so just you, you, you put a dot before well known? Is that yes. Yes. yes, that's right. So Acme, Acme. Oh, it's just Acme Challenge. Oh, oh okay. It's not plural. Um, so let me get this. Do, do, do. And I have, oh, that's not it. That's just browser. Enter. Yeah, this is probably there BBB. There we go. Okay, so that shows that I have my challenge directory set up. So let's actually do this. Um, so I'm going to use, back on my talk, where's my talk? Um, I'm going to use gethttpsforfree.com, which is a website that I run. It's just a static client side library, so it doesn't actually ask for my secrets or anything like that. Get htps for free .com. 
It looks super boring because it's supposed to look super boring. Um, so I'm going to start off by registering with Let's Encrypt. So I'm going to do webmaster at run.cheap. And how do I generate this? So this is the account public key. Um, so I have a little thing here. So I'm going to go ahead and generate that. Copy that. Go back to my server. Let's use not that folder, that's for sure. Um, it's Nginx, and I think I have a certs folder. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to generate a 4096 RSA key. Do, 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 doing its thing, blah, blah, blah. And so I have that. So I got my account key. And then print my public key. Let's do that. Oh, it's hard to do it on the projector. Copy that right over here. Here we go. So I got my public key here. Hooray. Let's go ahead and copy that. So this is the public key. This is not the private key that I'm pasting in here. And what this does is it basically takes that, turns it into a that JSON web uh, token uh, as a public key. Looks good, proceed to step two. Uh, certificate signing request, so that's that CSR that we were talking about earlier. How do I generate that? So first off, I'm gonna do a gen RSA for the domain key. Let's do that. So I'm gonna generate a new private key for a new 48 called domain.key, so that's different from the account.key. And it's gonna do that, do, do, do. So now I have two, one for account and one for domain. And then I am going to create a certificate signer request. And so that is this copy and paste area here. So let me edit that and change foo.com to efftalk.run.cheap and do that. And so now when I paste it into here, so you see I have my domain.key is what I am creating a CSR for and my DNS is efftalk.run.cheap. I'm gonna paste that print that out. And so this is my certificate signing request. I will grab that. Do, do, do. Grab all this sort of stuff. Copy that. Go back to the browser. And so again, this is all public information. So I'm not sharing my private keys at all with this browser or with this website. So it has no ability to do what I need to do. I'm going to validate that. Found domain, efftalkrun.cheat. Great. Okay, so first off, we need to accept the terms and conditions, and so that's the, um, that is the, so this is basically a copy and paste for my, using my account.key, and I'll show you what that looks like when I paste it into here. Let me actually clear this. So I paste it into here, and it outputs a particular payload that I'm supposed to sign, and pipes it to OpenSSL, signature for my private key, which is the account.key. And so this is basically how you generate those signatures um, in order to make those web requests. And so if I output that were here. In, were you just in VI or what did you? No, this is just pasted into the command line on my server. So that's, oh. and so. The website generated it based on what you already put in, right? Exactly. So it took my, it took my uh, CSR and generated a copy and pasteable thing. So I don't have to run any software on my server other than OpenSSL in order to make this work. Um, so if I copy the output, so this is the signature, and I paste it into here, and I press the accept terms. Oh, shoot. Well, we're going to open up the inspector and look at some of these web requests in a second. So I'm going to keep this open and keep this network tab open. Um, and then the next one is update my account. So I basically say I've accepted the terms. Now I need to set an email. Um, and you can put, it doesn't actually validate your email. The only thing that these emails is used for is to notify you when you're about to expire, like 10 days before you expire after the 90 days. Um, so, but it doesn't actually validate your email or anything. Um, did I copy that? Do, do, do. 
Hmm. Paste this, have another signature. Got the signature. Paste it into here. So now I have updated my account. And so let's take a look at that web request. So this is a post to Acme account, and that's my account number. And the request payload itself, as we saw here, let me just do the raw. Um, can I copy all of this? And then I have a little thing that I uh, can paste in, if you give me a second. So I have a little script that I wrote I can say here. So this prints basically the payload and the protected. And so if I paste in what I got from my network request into that, into here and say data equals whatever, and then I run it again, I should get, okay, so there's my signature. There's the protected. So I got RSA 256, and then this is my key ID, so that's the one that I registered. Um, and then this is a nonce that I got from Let's Encrypt, and this is the URL that I'm trying to do, and this is the payload, which is contact mail to. So that's what's in these API requests to the Let's Encrypt server. Okay? So just for review yep. here, I'm surprised there's so many signings, but um, we're, all we're trying to do is create this, this JSON document, right? It's, it's, it's We've been, yeah, each one of these creates its own JSON document. Its own? But yeah, so there... But eventually we need that one that you showed us previously, right? That, that had the, the, four, the three components? So every single API request builds one of those. So you, every those single API things. request that we're doing here is building one of those but, but and but sending it. the data format that all these API yes. requests can see. Every API request over Let's Encrypt. The thing of Jose is the encapsulation. Yeah. And the, pay, the data format would be inside the payload. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you guys interrupted him. You're, you're, you're actually yeah. answering my question. I, I yeah. Sidetracks. So, so, as you saw there, we did a, when I hit update account, and then I looked at the network inspector, it sent a request in that format. Yeah. When I do this again, we're going to look at the network again and see that it actually does another request in that same format. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign this. In that same JSON? Correct, exactly. So I'm gonna paste this here, I'm gonna get it signed, I'm gonna find my mouse, which I don't know where my mouse is. I'm gonna copy this, I'm gonna, and then paste it back in the browser, and then I'm gonna say create order, Oh, shoot. Oh, so we got to start over again. Okay, hang on. Verify info. Oh, I got a request. Dang it. Uh, so this is one of the downsides of doing this. Uh, doing it live. <laughs> doing it live. Uh, so I want domain pub out. So I'm going to speed through these a little bit faster. Uh, here. webmaster at run.cheap. But you, you guys kind of get the sense of what I'm doing here. Where I'm on my web server, I'm doing some things. Yeah. Uh, let's do this one, CSR, where's my mouse? Here it is. And obviously you can script this. Like these are all programmable steps, so I'm just doing it manually. Validate CSR. Copy that. Get it signed. And sign. Paste into here. So there's a bit of a timer on it. Yeah, that's nonce reuse. It just the nonce expires. No, it wasn't a. It was just a nonce timeout. Because like Let's Encrypt only has so many nonces it has available at any given time, and so you only have like I don't know a few minutes to, for each one for each request. Okay, so here I am creating my order. So I'm going to create my order. This is my signature for creating my order, 
And I'm, I'm logging all of these requests in the network debugger right now, and so we can take a look at them afterwards. So I can proceed to step four. First is verify ownership. So I'm gonna load my set of challenges at that point. So this is gonna see what my challenges are gonna be. So that's, you have to sign each one of these requests. So getting something still takes a signed request. So I'm gonna sign this, I'm gonna load my challenges. Okay, so I have my options are, I can run a Python server, I can run a file based. so that's what I'm gonna do. Um, or I can also do a DNS record. And so I can basically set a DNS domain here. Um, okay, so option two, file based. So I'm gonna do that, and I have to serve under this URL, the well-known Acme Challenge, slash that endpoint, I have to serve this content, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a file on my server, so I'm gonna to go to them, var, dub, 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 HTML, challenges, and then that particular file name, and I'm going to paste in that contents. Do, do, do. And then I'm going to save it. And so now, in theory, how do I do this? This should work. Yep. So I can now see that. And now I can click, let me collapse this. I'm now serving this file on efftalk.run.cheap and it will create the signature that I need to do in order to tell Let's Encrypt that I'm now serving that and so please go ahead and do the challenge. I'm gonna copy this and paste this, submit challenge challenge submitted, and then I can check to see the challenge status. It usually takes a few seconds, so I'm just gonna take my time copying and pasting this over here, and if it doesn't work, then we can always just check again in a moment. Do, do, do. I'm gonna paste this in. Challenge status. Oh, challenge complete. Awesome, so it was able to verify that file um, on that domain. So I can go ahead and finalize the order. So this is the certificate, the CSR. This payload includes the CSR. So it's gonna be super long. Um, but the signature is the same length. So I'm gonna copy and paste that back in for the finalization, finalize order. Ah, finalize, okay. So now it's actually generating, it's sending it over to the HSM sending that CSR to the HSM, the HSM is gonna sign it, and so in a few seconds, I should be able to check the generation status of that cert. So I'm gonna paste that in here, and paste that out. And then I'm going to paste it in here and check certificate status. Certificate ready! Hooray! So now I can actually download it, and downloading it again requires a signature. So. Wow. <laughs> so. Signatures. Yep. I mean, every single API request is signed. With a, sep with a separate. With a separate one. Yep. Yeah, so like this is, this website is for demonstration and hackathons. You don't want to use this for your production. Like you actually want to like write a script that does all this for you. You don't want to, <laughs> like this is way overkill. Okay, and hooray, I have my certificate here. So if I um, copy and paste this into uh, vim uh, domain.crt on my certs, and I just paste this in. Okay, so if you see here, we have several different certificates. So I have three different certificates. So I have my, my certificate here, and then I have the intermediate certificates, which then chain back to the root that's in my browser. And so if I... That was all one copy-paste? Yep, it was all one copy-paste. So they're all of the intermediates are included with the thing. Um, and then I write that, and then I chmod my domain uh, certificate uh, key to oh, change mod uh, six zero zero. Let's say sure. 
Okay, so now I have, to recap, so the domain I now key have, private? the main yeah. key is private, right? Your oh, certificate okay. is what we just generated, and your account key is what you are used to interact with Let's Encrypt. You actually don't have to have your account key on the server. If you noticed, like, I could have had that account key on my local system. So that can be independent. The only thing that you need um, on this is the challenge. And so, like, we didn't necessarily have to do this on the server. So let me do my nginx config service config test. So key is private. Um, okay. What's that? So where it says domain. Yeah, so these are the private keys. This is the private key. This is the public sign certificate that I just got. Okay? And so I'm going to actually show you. I'm going to update. So if I then dot dot sites enabled um, EFF talk. Okay, so I'm going to add. Um, actually, I'm going to set to paste. Um, so if I go, I have some copy and paste stuff here. I'm going to add an HTTPS, and I like I haven't done this. So if it breaks, we're going to troubleshoot it live. I'm going to paste in a SSL server. That's going to say use that domain CRT, okay? And I'm gonna save that, and then I'm gonna config test and see if it works. It works, so I'm gonna restart. Hopefully this works. And so now, if I go to HTTPS, EFF run cheap, I should get Boom, done. So now I have a fully browser trusted Let's Encrypt and I can go to, um, what's, what's the name of that test? TL or TLS test. Oh, I did. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, now I just like search for it. Um, what was it called? Yeah, here we go. SSL Labs. Yeah. So if I paste in EFF talk run cheap, submit that. Let's see what we got. Uh, okay, so while that runs, does anybody have any questions about what I just did? Yes. So. I can understand that you made a nice demonstration. You can see step by step. Uh, I might actually, if I was only going to do it once, I might actually try to use that. So is that yeah. website that you provide to the public yep. now for free? It's for free. Now, of course, it could be done in Linux. Yes. Um, so do you also provide for free an equivalent uh, script? Yes. On, yep. And that's going to be... So there for. are... Um, let's encrypt... Org. Uh, there is, is it documentation? There are Acme client implementations. Okay, so these are uh, recommended cert bots, so that's their official one. However, there are in various languages of your choice hundreds of imp like client implementations or scripts that you can use as an alternative. So, like mine, get HTTP, I'm pretty sure get HTTPS is not included in here, but my other one, Acme Tiny, yeah, so Python. So if you use Python, you can use Acme Tiny, and Acme Tiny is a 200 line script that does basically what we just did. With what dependencies? Open SSL. No dependencies. So Py Open SSL? Nope. It just shells out, uses a subprocess to the OpenSSL command line. So the idea is you can just copy and paste this, read through it, it's like well documented, um, and it does pretty much what we were saying. So like that, my goal with this one is that you, like please read the source code, you have to trust it with your account private key. Yeah. So I'm not sure, um, is, is, you said there's many, many, many of them, includes C++, which is yeah. what, I, what I like. Yeah. Uh, did you write all of them, or is this your website? Oh, or, or you, you, I wrote two of these. <laughs> these are all community 
contributed. So each one has to be separately trusted. Yes, exactly. Um, the official one is written by Let's Encrypt, so CertBot. If you want the ultimate trusted one, you use theirs. Which would do the same thing for me? Same thing. Same? Oh, I see. That's the one I used. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's by far the most prominently used one. And it's written I wrote different. mine because I wanted to learn the protocol and I wanted to teach myself it, and so I just wrote it, and it turned out to be super easy. And so I wrote both a browser one in JavaScript and a Python one. Oh. And so those are kind of things that are used. What? I'm just amused by that. I wanted to learn more about cars, so I built a car. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people do that, right? I, I guess that's fair. I, but there's I, so many. Okay, okay, so here we go. Hey, we got an A rating. It's just so extreme. I love it. It's so extreme. Well, so actually, so the real reason that I wrote it, I originally wrote another library called Let's Encrypt No Pseudo, because at the time when Let's Encrypt originally launched, um, they did not, so they're official implementation certbot was called the, just the, like the let's encrypt client and is that a recent change by the way oh, that's like four years ago or something it was not recent Maybe. um i thought i remembered that i guess not. yeah we're just time is flying by it's pre definitely pre-pandemic <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's gonna be so <laughs> that's the demarcation <laughs> for all of us, okay for all of us yeah students, that's gonna be a marker okay so uh so originally let's encrypt when they initially launched there were a you had to run it as sudo on your web server and it modified your Apache files and it was only a compatible with Apache at the time, not Nginx. And, and so a bunch of people were like, screw this. We are not trusting this thing to run on our server. But I was like, this is gonna change the web. And so what I did is I wrote a Python script that was the bare bones and you ran it on your local system and you just copy and pasted like we just did into the browser and so like I pitched it as like you don't need to run sudo like so it was let's encrypt without sudo was the name of the project and that basically anytime on like Hacker News or Reddit or anytime somebody would say oh I don't think let's encrypt like they you know they're they're a CIA thing and they're gonna like you know they want you to install this thing on their ser on your server and all that sort of stuff like I wrote that to specifically just link to and say shut up just use this alternative that doesn't require that. So like, stop naysaying. And so that really took a lot of the wind out of the sale, sales of the people who were like detractors early on because it basically said like, you don't have to trust them on their thing. They just wrote it to be convenient and to be you know easily installable and runnable for the vast majority. But the skeptics would still be able to like audit and use their own clients as well. And so like that early on, client as an alternative client um, eventually got merged into certbot as a like non-trusted version not my actual code but like the feature set got uh, merged in and also it kind of spawned a giant wave of all of these other alternative clients as well gotcha. and so like i feel like the early on like adoption of oh i can write my own client oh, let's make this a weekend project sort of thing. I feel like that really caused a lot of attraction in the sysadmin community because they were able to like find a client that, they, that spoke to them like C++ or like Python or whatever. And so they didn't have to use the officially sanctioned one. And that really like took a ton of the excuses away of people saying, oh, this is not a thing you should, you should trust. So yeah, any other questions? All right, so to recap, we went through the history of Let's Encrypt, the organization and mass surveillance and why it was set up to combat mass surveillance. Um, we actually got a real HTTPS certificate on my website and here it is, hooray. Uh, and we actually got it audited by the Qualsys SSL labs and got an A rating on it. So it is a legit certificate that Oh, it supports TLS 1.3, how about that? Uh, yeah. So that is my talk on Let's Encrypt and Acme. Yay. Quite a while since we've had a meetup where the speaker gave us a good live coding session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess I'll just stand up and tell everybody. Um, so yeah. Um, 
thanks for watching the video if you're still here. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out to um, EFF Austin um, either at info at EFFAustin.org or you can reach kevin.welch at EFFAustin.org. I'm happy to put you in touch with Daniel if you'd like to learn more, get slides, get resources, whatever, though I probably will hopefully have a link to said slides in the comments so you may just be able to get them there. But um, yeah, hope you all learned something. Uh, yeah, and uh, also hope you got a little bit of a window into, I think Daniel summed it up very well, that it's very easy to look at the world and go, there are these big problems and we can't actually solve them. And um, well, I hope maybe you've been given a window into, sometimes we don't need to be so defeatist. A small group of people who really believe in something can literally change the world. Uh, thanks, and we'll see you all next month.